Well, good morning, Emmanuel. Uh, this is a really majestic passage, probably one of the most famous in all of Scripture, and especially in Isaiah. So I, I want to go to the Lord and ask for his blessing upon the preaching of his word. I want God to deliver a sermon better than the one that I prepared for you, quite honestly. Uh, so, so that is my prayer. Uh, as, as we go to the Lord, you can pray with me. Uh, let's go to him now and ask God's blessing upon the preaching of his word. Oh, Father, indeed, I need something better than what I have, Lord. I need your word to be shown in power. And Father, I pray that your word would reap great fruit this morning in our midst. Father, would you magnify your name and show your son, Jesus Christ, as exalted in our midst. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I mentioned last week, we are over a year into the book of Isaiah. And in many ways, I am amazed that we have made it this far. And I'm sure that some of you might be as well. I take it as a testament to your patience and the kindness of God. Because if you have been here from the time that I began preaching this book until now, you have endured preaching on 39 chapters of judgment. 39 chapters of God's pouring out his judgment upon Judah and the surrounding nations for all that they have done. So you've endured a lot in these 39 chapters. And if ever we needed an example of the perseverance of the saints, there it is, right there. But this week is different. Because now Isaiah, he turns toward restoration. Have you ever gone to sleep and felt as though you slept so hard that when you woke up, it felt like you were in an unfamiliar time and place? Have you ever felt that? Have you ever felt like, man, what, what kind of sleep was that? Because this is totally different. Well, when I flipped open to Isaiah 40 this week, it almost felt like a Rip Van Winkle moment without the booze and the nagging wife. Do you guys remember the story? Uh, Rip Van Winkle, it's weird. It's weird. It begins in pre-revolutionary war America, and Rip's wife, Dame Van Winkle, she is always complaining about him. So one day, he pulls a redneck move, and he takes his trusted hound, and he goes hunting up in the Catskills, only to get up to the mountains and find some weird Dutch colony of men playing nine pins, just think bowling, if you would, and they're drinking from a keg. And without saying a word to them, Rip, he gets in on the fun, and he becomes so drunk that he quickly passes out. And when he wakes up, he realizes that he's awakened to a whole new world. His beard is over a foot long and it's gray. His dog is nowhere to be found. So he goes back to his village and someone asks him, so who'd you vote for? He says, what? I'm a loyal subject of King George III. And they're astounded. They look at him like he has a third eye on his head. Because whatever has happened... Rip Van Winkle eventually puts it together that whatever happened up on that mountain, he's been asleep for 20 years. Well, that, in a way, is similar to what happens in Isaiah 40. Because with the turning of the page from chapter 39 to chapter 40, we are in a whole new world. It's as though Isaiah goes to bed under the reign of Hezekiah in 700 BC at the end of chapter 39, and then he wakes up in Judah's exile, here in chapter 40 of Isaiah. But the word that Isaiah gives in chapter 40, it will not come to pass on earth until a little over a hundred years after it's written. So think, if I were to preach a message to you this morning that wouldn't come to fruition until 2123. That's the idea of what happens in Isaiah chapter 40. But this chapter is God's answer to all of the sin and disappointment that Judah has observed in themselves. They probably thought that their sin was too much for God to handle. Well, I don't know about you. I'm just glad that God's people don't experience sin and disappointment anymore. Amen? No. No, we do. We live in a world that's littered with disappointment, don't we? Disappointment with your family. Maybe they've not loved you like you hoped that they would. Disappointment with your job or your spouse or the prospects of romance before you now. 
Disappointment in your health. Things are falling apart quicker than you thought they would. Or disappointment with your church. These people are not the way that you wish that they were. Can people be disappointed with that? Yes, they can. Or maybe it's your children. Maybe they're not living the way that you think that they should. And perhaps most of all, if you're honest, you're disappointed with yourself. You're not the person you want to be. Not the person that you thought you would be. You haven't accomplished everything that you had set out for. Every single day, church, we swim in a world of disappointment. It's all around us, and if we are in a moment of humility, we will see that it is also within us. Well, a disappointed and dejected and sin-sick world is exactly the type of world where God comes to exalt His mercy and His grace. That's what God is going to do in Isaiah 40. Church, you might be disappointed with everything else in your life today. That might be true for you. But you can allow yourself to delight in the comfort and the goodness of God this morning. You can be real with God this morning and you can take comfort in His promises. Despite all of the discouragement in your life, you can be stirred by His comfort and His tenderness where you have only been cold and empty for so long. And that's the aim of Isaiah 40. So my aim is simply that we, as the people of God, would be comforted by the comfort that God provides us. But before I get too far, I have to give you an aside for just a couple of minutes, so just bear with me. If you've had any exposure to people writing about Isaiah that are just smart enough to be dumb, then allow me to give you a word for just a couple of minutes. If you spend any time studying the book of Isaiah, you know that there are people that come about at the end of the 18th century that they have a a certain idea about this book. They think that there are multiple Isaiahs who wrote Isaiah. So they believe that one person wrote Isaiah 1 through 39, and then another wrote Isaiah 40 through 56, and then another 56 through 66. And the last that I heard, they're up to three Isaiahs. At this point, I don't know, it could be more. They're like a a Dr. Seuss character. They just keep coming out of the hat. I don't know how many they have now. But it's not that these people are any smarter than you or I. No, it's rather that they read that the tone of Isaiah changes. But we see that, don't we? We see that. We see that in the course of 66 books, of course, his tone changes. Well, they're just smart enough to be dumb because they conclude that if the tone changes, then the author must change as well because it's impossible for one man to use different language or to strike a different tenor throughout the course of 66 chapters. Well, have you ever read any other book? They do that regularly. So that's the idea. I have to say this to us because What usually ends up happening is people will try to divide this book, and the reason why is because they don't believe that God could possibly foretell the future. So they determine, well, the only logical conclusion is that he didn't. They say it it would be uh, foolish for us to believe that God knows the future and can speak to that, so that is what they do. They say, no, we have one, two, and three Isaiahs. But friends, that is precisely why Isaiah is telling us this. Because he wants to show us that our God sees the future and he controls the future. He alone knows all of it. He alone is sovereign over all. But the second reason why I don't want any of us to be taken by this idea of multiple Isaiahs is because the Bible says otherwise. So if you would, just turn over to John chapter 12 just really quickly. Flip over to John, it's to your right. Flip over to John chapter 12 and look at what John says in verse 38. He's he's saying, he's making a point and he says, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And then what's he going to do? He quotes Isaiah 53. Lord, who has believed what we heard, what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then, not surprisingly, he attributes this to Isaiah. And then a few verses down, he quotes Isaiah again. He says, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. That's chapter 6. And he attributes it to Isaiah again. 
So this idea of multiple Isaiahs, it is foolish. Here's your options. Either be smarter than the Apostle John, who's inspired by the Holy Spirit and had a heck of a lot more time with Jesus than you or I will ever have, or you take God at his word and you trust that there's one Isaiah. Well, I don't know about you, but if I have to choose between Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Apostle John and some liberal scholars, I'm going with Jesus every time. It's, it's, a, it's a dead giveaway. I'm going with Jesus. Now, why does all this matter? Because we don't get to stand over the Bible and judge it. We stand under the Scripture and it judges us. It calls us to conform to the reality that it defines. We don't get to define reality, church. Well, that's the end of my sidebar. So you know that there is one Isaiah. So here's what the text says to us. Go back to Isaiah chapter 40. When we have suffered long enough, we are ready for God to restore us by his promises. When we have suffered long enough, we are ready for God to restore us by his promises. Look at verses 1 and 2. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Judah and Jerusalem have been disciplined for 39 chapters. And I know that this is hard for us as a society because we are steeped in a society that has twisted discipline to say that it's abusive. Or, on the other hand, maybe you grew up with abusive parents and it's legitimately hard for you to conceive of God's discipline as a measured, careful, wise, loving application of his wisdom. But God says... He disciplines the one that he loves. And he's been doing that for 39 chapters. Like a loving father, he displays his love toward his children in discipline. But as every parent knows, there's an end to all discipline, isn't there? Discipline exists because joyful submission doesn't. But discipline is only momentary. The aim of all discipline is restoration. And that's exactly what God says. He says there is a time when discipline will give way to comfort. Christianity is all about the grace of God. It's it's not about merely keeping a bunch of rules. Because when the discipline of God is over, he comforts us. And the word that Isaiah uses for comfort, it's the same word that's used in the Old Testament for someone who's just suffered uh, the death of a family member. It's the idea, when you've suffered loss, you know what this is like. When someone comes to console you, they put their arm around you, they look you in the eye, and they say, I am so sorry this happened to you. That's the idea. That's the idea. I want to care for you. This is God's comforting. And it's a double imperative in verse 1. So it's not just comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. No, it would be better to say, keep saying comfort, comfort, my people. So church, even if you've been walking in sin, even if you feel like God has been disciplining you, if you are a Christian, God's discipline, it is not to crush you. It is to restore you. Satan would like to tell you this morning that God's discipline is actually an evidence that he hates you. No. God disciplines us so that he might first restore us and then comfort us. As Psalm 30 verse 5 says, His anger is but for a moment, and His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping, it may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. No matter how long the discipline of God may last, church, His purpose for you, if you are a Christian, if you are His child, is not for your destruction, it's for your redemption. It's for your redemption. It might feel like all that you've been going through in this life, like you've been going through it forever. And it seems to never end. But if you are a Christian, this is your hope. That no matter how bad it may get, God's ultimate purpose is to restore us and to comfort us. Here's how I know. Even when they, act, they don't act like God's people, they are his people. After all of the judgment for 39 chapters... God still calls them my people. Sometimes, Emmanuel, one word makes all of the difference in the world. In the Jacob's house, 
we have been warming up for Christmas since uh, just around Thanksgiving. I'm not proud to admit it. I think I started even a week before singing Christmas carols. I'm not proud of it. it. But something good has come out of my weakness. We have either listened to or we have sung Hark the Herald Angels Sing easily north of 50 times, probably closer to 100 in the last month. So Augie, he has memorized the whole first verse of the song. And he'll belt it out with the best of them. If you ask him, he will sing it for you, I think, unless he's embarrassed. But there's something that I have to tell you. Because for the longest time, he would have the whole thing right except for one word. He would, see, he would sing, peace on earth and mercy died. <laughs> Instead of peace on earth and mercy mild. And I had to teach Augie, one word can make a whole difference, a whole world of difference. Because if mercy dies, we have no hope. No, but if mercy is mild, mercy is condescending to us, then that is encouraging. Well, here in verse 1, there is one word that makes all of the difference. Only it's not for ill, but rather it's for the good. God says they are my people. They are my people. In spite of all of Judah's failure, they are still God's people. Uh, Judah's like the prodigal son. She may have blown the inheritance. She might be eating with the pigs in their slop. But she's still got a daddy who loves her. And, and she's still got a home to fall on. When her senses, when, they come to, when she comes to herself, God says, Judah is still my people. He says, that's my baby. Anytime they need a place to fall, they can come home. It's hard to believe it if you know him, but in a former life, our, our dear brother, Jacob Gaeta, he struggled with addiction. And he said, when I was strung out on drugs, there was one person that I knew I, that would always love me, no matter how hard I had fallen, no matter what stupid thing I had done. He said, my mama will always love me. Spoken like a true mama's boy, Jacob. <laughs> But that's the idea. That's the idea. Judah, they have made a mess of everything. But they are still God's mess, aren't they? They are God's mess. No matter the mess that you have made of your life, if you are a Christian, you can take comfort because you are God's mess. But there's a second thing that they can take comfort in. Their sins have been paid for. Her iniquity is pardoned, Isaiah says. But how? That's the logical question for these Jews as they would hear this. Because they know the book of Leviticus says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And they also know that when they're deported to Babylon, the temple is going to be raised completely. So there's no place to go and offer sacrifice to God. There's no place to, to find forgiveness of sins. So the great conundrum of Isaiah 40, as we read it, is how is Israel's iniquity going to be pardoned if they're deported to Babylon? Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. So how can blood be shed for the forgiveness of their sins? What's their only hope? Well, the answer to that question doesn't come in Isaiah 40. It comes in Isaiah 53. Because God is going to send the most unlikely of his resources to pay for our sin. He's going to deliver hope through a baby of all things. A baby. As verse 5 will say, the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And just consider for a moment how absurd this is. The glory of the invisible God, the radiance of God himself, the omnipotent one becoming visible, revealing himself. Friends, if you're visiting us and you're wondering, what's so different about Christianity? This is it. That the invisible God becomes visible in the form of a baby. He takes on human flesh to come and ransom us from our sins. This is utterly astounding if we stop and think about it. Because the glorious one, the majestic God, would come in as a baby into this world that he created. God tabernacled not as a pillar of fire or as a cloud, but as an infant, a lowly baby. You know how long it takes most animals to walk? A couple of minutes, maybe an hour at best. So some of them it will take a few days or, or maybe a month. You know how long it takes a baby to walk? About a year, give or take a month. And this is, 
if you just see this, if you see this weakness of, of, of a baby, for the most part, all that a baby does for the first year of their life is eat, sleep, and poop. That's all they do. Trust me, I have one at home. Arch, I love you, but it's true. And parents, you better watch out because I've heard that if you're not careful, they revert to those same habits in high school. But our God, the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power, he came into it as the weakest of all creatures, a human baby. He eventually, he would take on their sin. He would grow up as a man. He would take sin upon the cross in his body. He would drink the cup of wrath. This is how they know that the forgiveness of sins is true. And it's not just some of her sins, is it? No, it is all. All, as verse 2 says. Incidentally, this is the only way that we can be made right before God. If God has forgiven all of our sin, because just one sin, if we had all of our sin except for one forgiven, and we just had one sin looming over us, that's enough to send us to hell. So friends, our hope is, is that this God, this one who came as a baby, this one will purchase our salvation. The gospel tells us that if we want forgiveness from God on account of our rebellion against Him, then it will only ever be purchased on credit. Only it's not your credit, it's the credit of Jesus Christ. So either our sin is paid for on His cross, or we will pay for it in full. Emmanuel Ultimate restoration and ultimate comfort, it can only be found in atonement. It can only be found in somebody paying for your sin. You need forgiveness. And if you've experienced atonement and you've experienced forgiveness from your sins through repentance and faith, then allow me to remind you this morning, your sins have been paid for. Your sins are totally washed. Don't look to yourself for comfort this morning. Look to Christ for comfort. If you look to yourself for comfort, Satan will whisper and tempt you to despair. Yeah, but if you were a better Christian, then you would perform better. There's no comfort to be found in that message. Christ performed where we could not. Satan might tempt us to despair. Yeah, but look at how much sin still dwells within you. Enough of that. Yes, we still sin. As much as we hate it, but we know that it has been paid for in whole. There's no more that remains. He might even tell you, you can't go to God. He'll just be mad at you. He'll rub your nose in your sin. No, he will say, you have been pardoned. You have been forgiven. He says, you are mine. Our God has broken into human history, church, to bring us comfort, Emmanuel. We are tempted to see God as merely having a, a puny little puddle of mercy, uh, something that could be dried up with a, a decent-sized bath towel. No, God, he has a whole ocean of mercy that he offers to us. His grace is sufficient for all of our sin. If we are in Christ, then this is our promise, that all of our sin has been paid for. Well, secondly, when God has waited long enough, he prepares us for the fulfillment of his promises. When God has waited long enough, he prepares us for the fulfillment of his promises. Read verses 3 through 5 with me. A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Here's what God is going to do. He is going to give them a sign that they have been forgiven. Judah is going to be exiled to Babylon. Now, if you don't know what that means, that means the Jews are going to have to walk hundreds of miles across the desert, across rivers, to get to a land where they will eventually be enslaved. And if you've ever walked a few miles, then you know, when you're walking, what do you do? You think. you got nothing else to do. You're walking. So what would the Jews, what would they have been tempted to think? They'd think God is no longer able to help us here because no longer are we in Jerusalem. Or even if they were uh, maybe even more cynical, they might have said, well, maybe the gods of Babylon 
are more powerful than our God. After all, why are we here if that's not the case? But God gives them this word in verses 3 through 5 to tell them that he will be there with them, that he will be there to comfort them and to protect them, and he would also rescue them. You see, the journey from Jerusalem to to Babylon is nothing for God. And someday soon, God is saying, I will comfort my people. I will rescue you. If Israel doesn't have a prophetic word, then think about this. They're going to be in captivity. They're going to suffer. Many of them are going to die. And, and, And not only might they suffer, but the worst thing that could happen to them is not to fall captivity. No, it's to fall into unbelief. And so God is giving them this word in verses 3 through 5 to say, I'm not going to allow you not to believe. You must believe in me because I know this has happened. I know it's going to happen. He plans that it will happen. Because discipline will not have the final say on God's people. You see, the intimate details of this prophecy, they provide the opportunity for God's trustworthiness to be shown. Think about this for a second. It's one thing for me to tell you, you're going to go through a a tremendous amount of suffering in your life. And to say, well, don't worry. I'll be there for you. God's got you. You'll be okay. It's one thing for me to say that. But what if I said, you're going to go through a tremendous amount of suffering. And then I proceeded to detail every single event down to the T. And I said, don't worry. I'm going to be there with you. And then it came to fruition. How would you feel? You would say, that guy knows something. I should listen to him. I should obey him. That's the reason why God is saying this in verses 3 through 5. He's saying, trust me in the deportation. Trust me down to the minutia of your life. Because if I have the power to tell you exactly what's going to happen, then I also have the power to fix it when it has happened to you. So why does this matter? Why does this matter? Even though we aren't in Babylon, we are in Babylon. We are in Babylon, Emmanuel. We're not in the physical location known as Babylon. I know that. We're in Schoolies Mountain. But we live in Babylon, don't we? We dwell in a land where vice is promoted as virtue. Where evil is touted as good. Where there are things that were once treated as mental illness in society. And now they're condoned not only as tolerable, but good. Where sexual immorality, like homosexuality and transgenderism, it's not only acceptable in today, it's promoted, isn't it? It's even forced upon children. You know what the Bible calls that? Babylon. He calls it Babylon. We live in a society where rampant self-indulgence and pleasure, it passes as a form of virtue. They they put a, a rubber stamp on it and they call it a luxurious lifestyle. We live in a society where statues to Satan are enshrined in our government. Well, the Bi- Bab- Babylon is here with us, church. It's all around us in this world. This world is not what it used to be. But let me remind you that just as surely as John the Baptist came preparing the way for the King of glory, Jesus will return again and he will establish his kingdom in power for all of the world to behold. That's good news, isn't it? As we look out at the darkness of our world, at the darkness of our society, and we see things going to pot, well, we can say, no, the Lord is going to come back. John says, the God of, Sa- the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. It's happening soon. We're going to be rescued from Babylon, brothers and sisters. And that re- reality, it should not lead us to passivity, but to action. Our part this week before Christmas and all of the rest of our lives is just like John the Baptist. Our role, if you're wondering, how how in the world does this apply to us, Adam? Well, here's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to believe God's promises and to prepare the way of the Lord. That's our role. We are the king's men and women, Emmanuel. We go ahead of him telling everyone, make way for the king, make way for the king, prepare for his coming. And when we dwell on the glory of Christ, the glory that we have been shown, then you and I, we can't help but to desire that glory to be shown in this world. We can't help it. When we consider 
the glory of the message of Christmas, then we are compelled to want that glory to be seen more and more throughout all of our lives. And this is why, as Christians, we aren't comfortable with the status quo, are we? We aren't comfortable with sin reigning in our hearts or around us. We aren't comfortable with being sinful, selfish husbands or wives. Not just because that other person is worthy of our love. No, but because God is worthy of his glory in our marriage. We aren't comfortable with being uh, typical worldly parents that shape our children into being self-worshippers or sports worshippers or Sunday-only Christians because God is worthy of his glory in our parenting. He's worthy of his glory in all of our children's lives. We aren't satisfied with being lazy employees because God is worthy of his glory in our work. There's nothing more practical in your life than the glory of God. Do you see that, EBC? There's nothing more practical than wanting the glory of Christ in this universe. And every square inch of this universe is Christ. So seek his glory. Point number three. We trust in the permanence of his promises, not the impermanence of man. We trust in the permanence of God's promises, not the impermanence of man. Isaiah says in verse 6, A voice says, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers The flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Isaiah hears another voice. And this time, it's telling Isaiah to tell us something about man. Man's glory and beauty, it's like the flower of the field. Now that it's almost winter, where are all the flowers? They're dead, aren't they? (laughs) Unless it's a poinsettia, they're dead. They're they're no longer growing. So stop and think about this for a second. By the year 2150, every single person in this room will be an afterthought in the world. You ever stop to think about that? In 127 years, you will be an afterthought. Nobody will remember you. Nobody will even care that you existed. But do you know what will still be producing fruit? God's word. God's word. God's word. Friend, our beauty and our might, it will perish, but God's word will never fail. Uh, Now, it could be that you're thinking, well, how's that supposed to comfort them? How's that supposed to comfort them? That's not exactly the most uplifting message to be reminded that we're like some old grass from the field, Adam. So why this message? Because all flesh is grass. We are so short-lived, aren't we? Even at our best, we are so momentary, even in our greatest strengths. Have you all ever heard of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? You guys know who that is? He's six-time NBA MVP. He led the league in scoring twice. He led in blocks four years. He was a 19-time NBA All-Star. That's almost two decades of being just dominant. That's incredible. Well, yesterday, I read that he fell at a concert and he broke his hip. And and we're not laughing at his demise, but but what does that tell us? It tells us that the glory of man is fleeting, isn't it? So somebody tell Tommy Cutlets to make the most of it, because it won't last. It won't last, will it? No. As the great warden Samuel Norton says, we up and vanish like a fart in the wind. But there is something permanent, church. It's the word of God. The word of God will prevail. God's promises to deliver his people will never fail. And this cuts in two directions as best as I can tell. One, the oppressors of the people of God, their glory will pass away. The Babylonians, they will pass away. No longer are they even on the map. Those who hate the church and hate the truth, they can seek to quench the truth of God and his word, but in the end, their attempts will be proven to be less than an ant trying to stand against an avalanche. You see, the other side of this is that as the people of God, we cannot save ourselves. Our beauty, our power, it's like grass. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. So we are entirely dependent upon God to deliver us and to deliver his promises. Emmanuel, this is why your great hope 
is not in your effort as a Christian. It's not in your ability to exert yourself in the Christian life. No, it is in the certainty of God's word. It's in the, the, the certainty of his promises. Everything else in your life, it may fail you. It could be that in God's infinite wisdom, that you are supposed to suffer like Job. Maybe you're going to lose everything in your life as you know it. Even if that happened, as everything else fails, as you lay in a hospital bed with nothing to your name and all signs of life growing dim, God's word will never fail you. It will never fail you, church. So bank your life on it. No matter what stands against him, God's word will never fail. Never. Human strength and wisdom, we can't, we can't ultimately trust in them because they will fail us. But our God, he has never made a promise that is too good to be true. He has never made a promise that he will not deliver. And here's another point of application for us as a church. If we believe in the promises of God enough to, to venture our eternity upon them, then we ought to believe in them enough to put them to work in our day-to-day lives. If we believe them for our salvation, we should believe them for our sanctification. Think of this. How much fear and anxiety would be addressed if we simply knew God's word more and we trusted in it? How much sin and unbelief would be addressed simply by knowing God's word and taking comfort in his promises rather than in our flesh? The person who trusts in the Bible is going to be vindicated no matter how foolish it appears to the rest of the world. The world looks at us as Christians, and it looks at us like people from New Jersey look upon West Virginians, okay? You understand that? It, it, it looks at us condescendingly. It thinks, what, what are these people? What do they believe? It's, it's so foolish. They're, they're simply people who can't quite come to grips with reality. That's what the world says about us. Uh, well... <laughs> Well, then she knows that New Jerseyans, they hear West Virginia, and they assume things, right? Don't they? Well, the world, it looks upon us, and it thinks that we're backwards. That's what it thinks. Well, trusting in God, trusting in the Bible, it's not some ignorant superstition. It's not some superficial belief. The world would want you to think that trusting in God is like an adult rubbing a lucky rabbit's foot. No, that's not what it is. We are trusting in the promises of an omnipotent, omniscient God. He knows everything, so we can trust Him. He's all-powerful, so we can trust Him, church. His Word will never change. It's always true. Don't things change so much in our world? The the styles, what, they, they change every 10, 20 years. The seasons, they change all the time. God's Word, it never changes. It never changes. It will stand upon the rest of eternity and God's word will never fail. It will never fail you. So cling to it, church. Cling to it. Give it your glad submission today. And because we're so sure that God's word will come to pass, here's what we should do. We should make the enjoyment of our God our greatest delight and we should declare it to others. This is my fourth point. Make the enjoyment of our God our greatest delight and declare them to others. Look at verses 9 through 11 with me. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd, He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Now, what does that mean? Get on up to a high mountain. Is Schooley's Mountain high enough or do we need to go up to High Point? What's that mean there? No, Isaiah, he's not talking about a physical location. He's telling us to be so confident and so bold in God's promises that we go to the point of telling the watching world who he is. If you're a Christian, then the best thing that you can do for someone, the best gift that you can give them, not only over the course of this next week, but for the rest of your life, 
is to explain to them and to display to them the beauty of our God. We should overflow in praise of our God due to his comfort of us. It's, it's this idea in Isaiah 40, if this were a musical, someone would just break out in song at this point. And I know that, that's uncomfortable if you're like me. I, I, I don't exactly just break out into song very easily. But that's the idea of what Isaiah is saying. He's, he's saying, to quote the great movie Elf, I'm in love, I'm in love, and I don't care who knows it, right? That's the idea. He says, get up to the high hill and tell everybody about the beauty of your God. And if you're thinking, no, I'm, that's not for me. I'm not that type of person. I'm not effusive in my praise. Yes, you are. You just don't know it. C.S. Lewis says, the world, it rings with praise. Lovers praising each other. Readers praising their favorite books. Players praising their favorite game or their favorite team. The praise of movies or restaurants, colleges, countries, historical figures, children, even rare stamps, rare beetles. There's somebody who praises those things. Even sometimes politicians. God love them. I don't, I don't know who, who would praise that. Uh, but we can't help but to praise. We can't help but to praise. And what's more, we can't help but to encourage others to share in our praise. We say things like, isn't she lovely? Or wasn't it glorious? Wasn't that awesome? Well, Lewis says, we delight in praise because the end of praise is the enjoyment for others as well. So church, the end of our enjoyment of God should be praise telling others about him. Husbands, think about this. How many times have you told your wives, I, I, your wife, I, I love you. You're so beautiful. How many times have you told her? Now, I hope it's a lot. And if you, if you have told her a lot, it, you're not telling her because she doesn't already know that, are you? No, you're telling her because the end of all praise is that sort of enjoyment. You have to vocalize it. You can't keep it in. You have to bring it out. She already knows that you think she's beautiful and that you love her. But the end of enjoyment is praise. The completion of our enjoyment, when we are so satisfied in what God has done for us in Christ, when we are so satisfied that he has forgiven all of our sin, the end of our enjoyment is to praise God before others. So church, this is our work. This is our desire. That, that, that just like when we go to a restaurant and have a great experience, we can't help but to leave a review. We'll go out of our way to write a 10-minute review. Why? because we want everyone else to share in the glory of whatever that was. Well, church, how much more should we do that for Christ? How much more should we be so satisfied in the comfort of knowing that all of our sins are forgiven upon the cross, that all of God's grace has been shown to us, and that we are his sons and daughters? It's one thing to say, uh, you know, I'm going to go to this great movie. I'm going to enjoy it for myself. But it makes it so much more enjoyable to go and enjoy it with somebody else, doesn't it? Because then you can talk about it. Well, that's the idea with the glory of Christ. Our objective as we go out is for God to fill us so deeply with his praise that we can't help but to overflow and to declare him to others. Parents, how many of us want to see our children growing and flourishing in their relationship with Christ? I would hope that all of you would raise your hand. Well, what would it do for that end if moms and dads were so satisfied in him, were so deeply moved by the fact that we are God's sons and daughters, that we can't help but to overflow in praise on our children? How compelling would that be? How compelling would that be? Our goal as Christians is to get ourselves so satisfied in God that we pull others into the vortex of worshiping him because that is what our hearts exude. And here's two things to fuel the overflow of your praising God as you leave. Number one, God's arm is strong and mighty to save. He can save to the uttermost. He can save you no matter what you've been in. He can save you no matter what you've been through. And at the same time, he is a tender shepherd that will care for his lambs. God doesn't come to you and, and, and wait for you to turn back to him and say, ah, oh, that's not good enough, try harder. No, he rescues tenderly. 
He picks up his sheep and he carries them. Do we fall in sin and do we fall short of God's glory? Yes, yes we do. But our sin will never have the last word. It never gets the last word. You might have come in discouraged looking back on the last week, looking back on the rest of your life and seeing, I don't meet God's expectation. Well, surely in a way that is true, but it's not the whole story. It's not the whole story. Because God's grace triumphs over all of the sins of his people. James 5.13 says, Mercy triumphs over judgment. And church, this is why we can take his promises to the bank this morning that despite all of our failure, despite all of our inadequacy, Christ's promises of our salvation are sure. And on account of that, EBC, we are anchored in his word that we are blood-bought sons and daughters. We have promises that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. He is our God and we are his people. So let's pray. Oh Lord, comfort, comfort your people. Keep comforting your people. Father, I pray that by your word that has been preached, by these truths that have been made known to us, I pray even in some small way in Isaiah 40, that your people will be comforted, Father. I pray that they would be built up, that they would be strengthened, to see your grace and your glory, and to overflow with praise. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.